Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Several years ago, we had Pistol Pete Maravich to give his testimony in our worship service. Pistol Pete Maravich was one of the greatest college basketball players who ever played the game. He would have been one of the great NFL gate, gate, greats if his name had not been lost in the fact that he was ill and didn't, wasn't able to play a great deal after college and lost his life to that illness. One day, Pistol Pete Maravich re received Christ as Savior and Lord. And he called a pastor friend of mine, and he said to my pastor friend, do you baptize people? And my friend said, well, yes, I do. He said, I mean, do you really baptize them? Do you put them all the way under the water and bring them up? And he said, well, yes, I do. And, the, and the Pete said, well, would you baptize me? And he said, well, I, I sure would. Would you come and see me? And when Pistol Pete Maravich walked into the pastor's office, he saw the Bible open on the desk. He saw books about that passage of Scripture surrounding the Bible. He, he saw the commentaries on the books on the walls and all the books about the Bible there. And Pistol Pete Maravich said to the pastor, is this what you do? Do you spend hours a day looking at God's Word and studying God's Word so you can tell people what God's Word says? And the pastor said, well, that's what I do a lot of my time. And the greatest basketball player of his day looked at the little Baptist preacher and said, you're the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Those of us who get to handle God's word are the luckiest people on the face of the earth. We're handling something that changes lives, and especially around Easter time, are we uh, aware of the wonderful things we find in God's Word. Now, I, I love to read the history of the resurrection. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and read about how these, the Lord came out of his grave and all the things that happened and how there was a lot of running in the cemetery. I haven't seen much running in a cemetery ever. Have you? They, they were running all over the place. They were so excited about Christ being risen. But my favorite scripture is 1 Corinthians 15. Anybody who's been around me for any while at all probably knows that. 1 Corinthians 15 is my favorite scripture because it not only tells us what about Easter, it tells us so what? It tells us what it means to know a Lord who has risen from the grave. It tells us what Easter is all about. It's not about little preachers standing up preaching sermons about Christ risen. It's about God, and it's about you and me. It's about how God loves you and me and wants us to have life eternal. He wants us to know that our sin debt is paid for. There's always a cross before the resurrection. And on that cross, he paid for all of our sins. Do you understand that? He paid for all of your sins on the cross, all of them, all you have committed, all you are committing, all you are going co to commit. God has paid for all those sins. The debt is paid on the cross. It is finished. The sin debt is paid. And the Lord says, when you and I come to know Christ as Savior, we celebrate the fact that we don't have to worry about the consequences of our sins. And 1 Corinthians 15 tells us about that. It says that our gospel is based on facts. And these facts are that Jesus Christ died. That's a historical fact. And they buried him, and it's documented. They buried him. They sealed the tomb. The word went out all over Palestine. He's dead and buried and on the third day, he came out of the grave. And that's a fact. And the thing that makes these facts a gospel for you and me is that Jesus died for our sins, just like the Scripture said he would. And they buried him like the Scripture said he would be buried. And he rose again on the third day, just like the Word of God said that he would. And the ever-pragmatic Apostle Paul who wrote, this, who wrote this text said, of all the people who saw the Christ, there are still 500 of them alive. In fact, he said to the Corinthians, some of them are coming through town next week, and you can get the first-hand account from them. And then for more than 50 verses, he talks about what it means. What it means to link your life by faith to a living Lord. And then he caps it all off. In the last paragraph of that 1 Corinthians 15, he caps it all off, and he says, Death, death, where now is your sting? Is your Easter victory such that you can say, Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? 
The sting of death is sin. We're afraid of death because of our sins, and we'll have to face the consequences we're afraid. The sting of death is sin. The strength of the sin is the law. We know what sin is because the Scripture, the law, tells us what sin is, spells it out clearly what sin is. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanks be to God. Winston Churchill once made a speech about how to make speeches. And he said, when you get up to make a talk, don't ever use a big word when a little word will do. And he said, and don't ever use a new little word when an old little word will do. And he said, and when you make a speech, get one idea, not two, just one. And you give your idea a whack. And you talk on for a while, and you give your idea another whack. And you talk on for a while, and you give your idea a terrific whack, and then you sit down. And that's the way to make a speech. I have learned something in almost 50 years of studying the Word of God. There is one great idea in every passage of Scripture. One idea. And when you study the Word of God, when you pick a piece of the Word of God and spend hours with it and study it, look for the one great idea. And the one great idea in 1 Corinthians 15 is the word victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. He gives us victory. Now, there is a thing about Easter I like to think. And I know you can't make this crawl on all fours, but I like to think of Easter as a place. You know, you've heard people say, you know, he's going places. That means he's getting somewhere in life. In that sense, I'd like to say one of the places you've got to go if you're going to get to the good places in life is you've got to go to Easter. You've got to go there and let Jesus Christ's death pay for your sins. We talked about how all the sin debt was paid on the cross. That's true, but you've got to receive it. You've got to say, Lord, you're right about me. I am a sinner. You've got to say, Lord, I am sorry for my sins. I'm so sorry I don't want to commit them anymore. I'm willing to give my life to you. I'm willing to repent and turn from my sins and, and to turn to you. That's how you meet Christ at Easter, saying, Lord, you're right about the sin in my life. It's killing me, and I'll never know to the, go to the good places as long as that sin is a part of my life and I come to Christ to have victory over my sin. I loved reading our newspaper this morning. I want to thank you who put out our newspaper in Jackson today. There's so very much about the Lord Christ in today's paper. Now the front page banner headline says something about new beginning in Christ, and then it said dash 1F, you know, for first page of section F. That 1F to me looked like if. New beginning in Christ if, if you come to him as your Lord and Savior, if you admit he's right about the sin in your life, if you will come to him and say, Lord, I will follow you with my heart and soul. I want to be yours like the testimony in baptism this morning. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. When you come to that, there's new life in Christ if you come to him. That's what he wants you to know. The places of good in life will, will happen when you go to him. Now, years ago, there was a literary phenomenon written. I've shared with this with you several times. It's, it's something that's fascinating to me because the way it, it took charge in our land in so many people's hearts. And I live just a few miles from the man who wrote it, and, and uh, he was an interesting person. This is a little book of 956 words, less than 1,000 words. It was on the bestsellers list for the New York Times for more than five years, week after week after week after week, sold for $20 a copy, less than 1,000 words. And he talked about, oh, the places you'll go. And I think Easter is about what places you're going to go in life and beyond life, the places you'll go. Remember, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off in a way. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you're the one who'll decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care about some you may say, I don't choose to go there. 
with your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not-so-smart street. You may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there in the wide open air. Out there, things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsie as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry. Don't stew. Just go right along. You'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go, you'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be best of the best. Wherever you go, you'll top all the rest except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch. Your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump, and then chances are you'll be in a slump. Now, when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. You'll come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're darked. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, do you turn left or right? Or right in three quarters? Or maybe not quite? Or go around back and slip in from behind? Simple, it's not, I'm afraid you'll find, for a mind maker upper to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start him to race down long wiggle roads at a breaknecking pace and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space, headed, I fear, for a most useless place, a waiting place, where everyone's just waiting, waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or a phone to ring, or a snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or a no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone's just waiting, waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for a wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting perhaps for your Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone's just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying. You'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing with banners flip-flopping. Once more, you'll fly high, ready for anything under the sky, ready because you're that kind of guy. All oh, the places you go, there's fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical things you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all, fame. You'll be famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you win on TV except when they don't, because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too, games you can't win because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not, alone is what you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There's some down the road between hither and yon that will scare you so much you won't want to go on but on you will go, though the weather be foul. On you will go, though your enemies prowl. On you will go through the hacking cracks howl. Onward up many a frightening creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact. And remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft and never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and 3 quarters percent guaranteed. Kids, you'll move mountains. So be your name Bixbong, Bixby or Bray or Mordecai, Ali, Van Allen, O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Doesn't offer any kind of help for living, just observation. Doesn't really do anything but just give as optimistic a view of life as we can possibly have. Does not provide any kind of solution for the problems we face in life. Not even much advice, really, in the piece. And yet we're so interested. We're so captivated because it talks to us about the places we'll go. My thesis is that if you go to Easter, if you go to Christ, if you meet him 
Watch him die for your sins on the cross. Watch him come out of his grave saying, I didn't do this just to show off. I did this to give you life. All the places you'll go. And there are places that Dr. Seuss didn't mention, places beyond life. Every one of us will go to places beyond this life. I love that little story of Roy Fish about Mr. Jenner, the man in Sydney, Australia, who walked up and down the busiest street there, George Street, and used to all of a sudden appear in front of people and say, pardon me, could I take a minute of your time? I'd like to ask you a question. If you die today, where will you go? The Bible says it'll either be heaven or hell. That's all. Just wanted to say that to you. Have a nice day. Toodaloo. And he was gone. But the fact is that beyond this life, it will be heaven or hell. Oh, the places you'll go. Easter says you don't have to go to hell. Without it, you do. That's the basic message of Easter. Dr. Ray, Ray Summers was one of my favorite professors in seminary. He made the Word of God come alive to me, and I loved him so very much. And he was such a great pastor heart for all the young pastors he was training. His class one year was the first one on the first day of school of each week. Most of us were little country preachers on weekends. We'd drive out from the seminary and spend Friday and Saturday and Sunday at our local churches and drive back in Monday to go to school. So he'd have us give a report about what happened over the weekend. One day, one of my friends was terribly distraught, and you could see that. And he, when he was asked to give his report, he said, Dr. Summers, we had a, a kind of a business meeting at our church on Sunday afternoon, and it was, a, it was a terrible time. Things just got completely out of hand. He said, in fact, one of, one of my members told me to go to hell. And Dr. Summers said, well, son, you don't have to do it. <laughs> it's the message of Easter is that you don't have to do it. You don't have to go there. You just don't have to do it. Interesting thing about Easter is it talks about another place and uses the word place a great deal. Remember John 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, a place. He said it's a home place. It's a Father's house. That's what Easter is about, so we can go to the place when life is over. It's an inheritance, says 1 Peter 1 and verse 5. It's an inheritance. That's a good earthly word. You can't lose it. The Word says it's your inheritance, and God has promised that for you. But there's more than just life beyond death. There's life in time, not just beyond time, but life in time. The Lord wants us to know that He understands what really destroys our life. I wonder if you know that. It's the word sin. Do you take that word very seriously? Maybe it'll help you understand better if you just review again what the word really means. When you see in English the word sin being translated, it's translated from one usually of three meanings, three specific meaning words. One of those words that's translated sin means to miss the mark means there's a, there's a bullseye in life, and we shoot for it, but we always fall short. We, we miss the mark. That's what Romans 3.23 means when he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It literally says, For all have missed the mark and come short of God's glory. Life has a bullseye, and you know in your heart you've missed it. Sin did that to you. Perversion of purpose is the other word. Have you ever had an automobile you loved and you had an accident and a wreck? And uh, the car was just torn up. This thing made for something, made to take you in comfort to, from here to there, but now it can no longer do that. It's twisted, all out of shape. It cannot do the thing it was meant to do. That's the perfect picture of what sin does in our life. Satan can't create anything in us. God created us. Every drive, every desire, everything we are, God made. But sin comes and takes the beautiful thing God made and wrecks it, perverts it, twists it, all out of shape and so that it cannot do its purpose. And that makes life miserable. The other word is rebellion. 
It literally means rebellion against who you are. I wonder how many people destroy lives because they rebel against who they are. I'll be my God. They can't be their God. They're not God. They're rebelling against who they are. You're not God. You're a creature of God. You function as a creature of God. You don't function as God. When you rebel against who you are, you destroy your life. Rebellion. Dr. Seuss didn't know the word sin, perhaps. I don't know. But he, uh, he sure understood it. Not so smart streets, that's sin. Coming down from a high, coming down from some great big high with a terrible bump, and then after that you're in a depressed slump. How many have been so high and then they had to come down? You always do. And then the depression follows that. Confused indecision racing at breakneck speed down some wiggle road only to come to a useless place in life. How many have run down that road and gotten to the useless place? Alone. Alone. Games you can't win because you play against you. How many people do you know who play against themselves and hurt themselves by what they do? He understood sin because he understood people. He may not have known the word, but he understood what it does to lives. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, you come to me and I'll give you victory. You come to me and I'll bless you with life. We'll cleanse your heart from all of those sins. You can come to me and know what it is to live, to have purpose and joy in life. And the line is, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wouldn't that be a great place for the chapter to end? If you and I were writing that chapter in God's Word, that's where it would end. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's a great place to stop it. But there's one more line. It's very important. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, stand firm, unmovable. Don't let anything move you. For you know that whatever you do in the Lord is not in vain. You see, the one thing you need to live is purpose. It's a real reason to live. I was at the sunrise service at the Ag Museum this morning, sat on the platform with people, and, and I, I, I knew those people. They're from several different denominations and different organizations in town, and each one of them is a dynamic person. And I realized the thing that gave them their life was their, their purpose. They believe so much in what they're doing. They believe so very much that there's a reason to get up each morning and that this thing makes a difference, and, and God is going to use them. There's purpose. Purpose. That's what gives you dynamic. That's what makes you real. Purpose. And the Bible promises that whatever you do in the name of the Lord is not in vain. It's going to count. Everything you do for Christ, you're going to be rewarded for. Every cent you give to eternal purposes is going to be compounded to your interest throughout eternity. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6. It's all going to count. You're not going to do anything. Every prayer you offer, you people who pray, what a difference you make. Every prayer you offer is going to count. Nothing is ever done in vain when it's done for Christ. And so the Easter challenge is to be a winner. Be a winner beyond time. And when you know you're a winner beyond time, then you can be free to live your life in time. And you can know that your, your sins have been forgiven and your life is there. And you can have a purpose, knowing that whatever you do to the glory of God is never going without reward or without fulfillment or without success. There's purpose in that. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for living within us. We thank you for loving us. And I pray now you'll guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to invite you now to do something that I think ought to be the normal and natural way to conclude a time of worship, and that is for you to come and make a decision that honors our Lord Christ. 
We're going to give you opportunity to make private decisions if you want to in a little bit. But I'd like to encourage you, and when we're standing, if there's some public commitment you need to make to accept Christ as Savior, to move your membership to our church, what a great day to do that on Easter, uh, to rededicate your life, to surrender for that special task God is calling you to do, or to say, Lord, I don't know what you want me to do, but I have these strong feelings in my heart. It's something, and whatever it is, I want to know it, and I want to do it. What a great thing to do that publicly. When Jesus was crucified, when they stripped him and beat him and humiliated him, and he died for your sins on that cross, there were more people watching than are in this room. And he did it. Would you like to say to him, Lord, with all these people watching, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the thing that pleases you. Let's stand quietly, reverently, and you come.